My talk today will uh, be about anaphylaxis to biological agents and uh, desensitization. And those are my financial uh, relationships. Um, we are in an era of uh, drug allergy uh, in precision medicine where we have available to us uh, from epidemiological data um, to clinical data that can be translated in metabolomes, microbiome, exposomes, genomes, and transcriptomes. And uh, we are aiming towards uh, uh, making an accurate diagnosis, uh, targeted treatment, and improving uh, the outcomes and the quality of life. And because of that, we have now available uh, in, approved by the FDA and by many other institutions uh, and uh, agencies in the world, uh, monoclonal antibodies and biological agents. And uh, those uh, have been having an exponential increase up to, uh, I show here up to a, uh, 2017, that uh, at least 10 new monoclonals. And in 2020, we have a same number of monoclonals. So we have now not 70, but close to 90 monoclonals that uh, are uh, FDA approved, and their revenue uh, is almost 90% of pharmaceutical sales. And so we are going to live in an era where monoclonal antibodies and biological agents are going to dominate uh, the practice of medicine. And uh, this comes with a price, and the price is, is that um, those agents are going to produce some side effects. And today we are going to review uh, briefly uh, what can be done. Initially, what is the presentation of those potential side effects? Uh, what uh, will be the management? And, and finally, uh, how to reintroduce in patients who uh, really need those monoclonal antibodies and biological agents for treatment of cancer, for treatment of inflammatory diseases, from tumor of severe diseases, how can we reintroduce those agents uh, to the patient? We have, since 2017, defined in precision medicine what is uh, what we call now the uh, phenotypes, drug allergy phenotypes. Those would be defined as reactions to occur uh, within either immediate onset one to six hours or delayed onset. Uh, we also have defined now uh, the endotypes. What is underlying those uh, phenotypes without those presentation? Is it an Ig mediated reaction? Is it a direct mast cell uh, activation or basophilt? Is it through uh, the new uh, a receptor on mast cells, MRGPRX2? Is it a cytokine storm? Is it a mixed uh, picture? Um, and then we will have delayed onset reactions where we can have from T cells to virus activated reactions to HLA uh, susceptibility. And we have now biomarkers that will help us define how we can uh, understand our endotypes and uh, the phenotypes, and we are going to be able to rely on those myomarkers to uh, be able to produce management options and treatment options. So if we look at uh, uh, the phenotypes that we have here, we can see that type 1, uh, uh, what we call IgE and non-IgE, are uh, the phenotypes that activate uh, mast cells. And we see here that it can be through uh, IgE, IgG. Uh, in patients who have mast cell activation disorders, we can activate through KIT, and we can also activate through uh, new receptors, and this is one of them, MRGPRX2, as mentioned. Uh, we also know that the biomarkers of those reactions are going to be histamine, tryptase, and, and more. And we know that the symptoms are going to be here from flushing to uh, itching to urticaria to um, uh, gastrointestinal symptoms to cardiovascular symptoms and ultimately to uh, anaphylaxis. And that the, the treatment of uh, the reaction is going to be epinephrine and desensitization, which is uh, uh, with what we are going to look into uh, for the treatment of those reactions is indicated. We have also uh, nowadays defined what we call cytokine release or cytokine storm reactions, in which other than mast cells are involved, whether T cells, whether macrophages, whether dendritic cells, or monocytes, and the release is mostly of uh, uh, cytokines from IL-6 to TNF-alpha to interleukin-1-beta, 
the symptoms are highly different. Uh, there are fever, there are chills, there is rigors, there can be hypoxia, hypotension. But, and the treatment in some instances can be similar. Uh, and selected cases can be amenable to desensitization. Most importantly, we have now defined what is mixed reactions, uh, and those mixed reactions have features of type 1 reactions and features uh, of um, cytokine release syndromes where uh, urticaria, flushing, uh, throat tightening, wheezing can be associated with fever, with chills, with uh, pain, which is this was one of the new features of uh, those reactions. And again, in selected cases, we are going to be able to deliver uh, desensitization for those patients. Um, lastly, uh, complement mediated reactions in those reactions where we can actually have a histamine as a, a phenotype and potentially tryptase, we uh, are not indicating uh, desensitization. Um, we have that hypersensitivity to monoclonal antibodies uh, occurs with uh, pretty much uh, all uh, antibodies from rituximab, which is here with a high frequency up to 5 to 10 percent, but other uh, monoclonals of atumumab, trastuzumab, cetuximab, tocilizumab, infliximab, and, and further, uh, all of them can have like a frequency of 0 0.2 to uh, 1 and, and to further. So again, uh, depending on uh, the ability of those uh, antibodies to produce reactions, we will have a higher frequency. For example, Cetuximab, because of the glycosylation pathway in the uh, galactose, 1 to 3 uh, galactose and sialic acid, uh, this uh, monoclonal antibody has uh, been uh, able to induce pretty severe anaphylactic reaction in patients who have uh, been uh, presenting uh, antibodies to the uh, glycosylation pattern here, and they have acquired that through a uh, tick. Uh, 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 bites and uh, uh, the patients can present reactions at first exposure. We can also see, uh, for example, that uh, Steven Johnson and uh, very severe reactions can occur with uh, um, uh, monoclonal antibodies. And we have here uh, Mogamolizumab. Uh, it's a, an antibody against uh, CCR4 that is used for T cell leukemia lymphoma. And we see here that in a patient who responded initially very well uh, to the treatment uh, uh, with a lowering of uh, the uh, T cells, uh, the uh, symptoms of Steven Johnson and skin rash occurred. And you see here that the phenotype is typical with expo, uh, which um, uh, was found to uh, be in the chest, in the uh, peripheral uh, limbs, and uh, in the face uh, with um, a rash, but also some blisters. And we see that there is invasion of those uh, T cells in the skin lesions and that uh, expression of the CD4 and um, uh, those um, CXC, uh, um, Fox B3 cells uh, was found to be uh, positive. And in this case, unfortunately, we cannot uh, do anything for the patient cannot be desensitized. The patient cannot use uh, this agent and we have to discontinue um, the, uh, the agent. So we have here a clinical vignette that I want to expand for you because this would be a prototypic presentation for patients who react to uh, monoclonal antibodies. We have here a 61-year-old male with marginal zone lymphoma who is on rituximab and has been on rituximab for a while with very good response of his cancer. So uh, he presented on the eighth lifetime exposure, immediate uh, sweating, some flushing, some chest pain, and uh, he had the infusion that was stopped, um, and uh, uh, symptoms recur when the patient was reinfused, and he had, in addition to that, some flushing, uh, and uh, he was treated with steroids, and the infusion was discontinued. So the question here was, should we change to a second-line treatment? Can we use something that has the same capacity uh, than uh, rituximab? Or uh, if uh, we don't have the availability of that agent, can we actually evaluate the patient for potential desensitization? 
So the patient underwent skin testing, which was positive at uh, one milligram per ml, and it was deemed that uh, his reaction uh, presented like two organ systems, uh, and it was also uh, as mixed reaction, and a three back 12 step protocol was indicated for um, the patient. So the patient was premedicated, and despite premedication uh, during the desensitization, he presented at the last step of his desensitization some flushing, some chills, uh, and he was restless. He was actually um, treated with fluids. Uh, he presented a fever, and he would also be treated with that. And what we see here uh, is that he presented an elevation of his tryptase. Uh, from the baseline of 6.1, he went to 10.2, but he also presented a very severe elevation of his IL-6 for more than 1,000 picograms per milliliter with a normal range of 17.4. So it was deemed that the reaction was a mixed reaction and the patient underwent further desensitizations with modification of his protocol. So again, uh, he uh, completed uh, the next cycles with addition of some fluids and continued with no reaction. So we can show here that the patient was a good candidate that would uh, benefit from uh, desensitization. So the biomarkers that we have to assess reactions to monoclonal antibodies, one of them is a skin testing. So we see here that um, we had already published in 2016 that skin testing can be done with monoclonal antibodies, whether rituximab, infliximab, trastuzumab, bevacizumab, tocilizumab, cetuximab. So all of those antibodies can actually be tested on skin testing and produce uh, a really good uh, positive or negative predictive value. But unfortunately, one of the important things to note is that expensive and most of the time can be unavailable. So one of the uh, unmet needs that we are asking the pharmaceutical companies is can we be, produce vials that contain 0.5 ml that uh, would allow us when a patient reacts uh, to take that vial and to assess skin testing. Uh, the uh, skin testing can be used uh, as here uh, in this uh, diagram uh, for Again, severe reactions, moderate reactions, or mild reactions. A skin testing for mild reactions, if positive, can induce uh, a recommendation for rapid desensitization. And uh, for uh, uh, negative skin testing with a mild reaction, we can see that premedication and uh, re-exposure with normal infusion can be also be recommended depending on the patient, the lack of comorbidities, and also the indication is it first line therapy. For moderate to severe reactions, uh, we have that skin testing can lead, uh, if positive, to rapid desensitization. So again, we have provided evidence that um, monoclonal antibodies can be very uh, uh, appropriately evaluated by uh, skin testing, and that would provide us with a lead towards the indication for desensitization. We can also apply to monoclonal antibodies other uh, biomarkers. And we have here that basophil activation test is uh, one of the uh, biomarkers that we actually use. We have here another clinical vignette uh, with uh, the, uh, a younger female with HER2 positive metastatic breast cancer. And within uh, two to three minutes after the second administration of uh, pertuzumab, uh, she had uh, pruritus, she had epigastric pain, she had vomiting, she had dyspnea, wheezing, and presyncope, and the oxygen um, was decreased. Uh, she had a very low blood pressure, and uh, she um, uh, would receive epinephrine uh, and uh, steroids as well as antihistamines and fluids, and uh, the patient uh, showed that the skin test in this patient was negative, whether it was because we did it too early in our um, evaluation. Again, uh, the timing for skin testing is still being worked, but for monoclonal antibodies, we have done at least two weeks after the initial reaction. Sometimes it requires more time, like we have seen with Hymenoptera, that three or four weeks are necessary for positive skin testing. But here we have another tool, which would be basophil activation test, and the patient was successfully desensitized based on a positive biomarker. 
the uh, patients uh, who present reactions also can be evaluated with tryptase, the ma major protease of mast cells. And we see here that a patient who reacted during the initial um, reaction to the monoclonal antibody has an elevated tryptase level. The normal range is here, 11.4, so 39.2. And during desensitization, the level went to, uh, to uh, almost normal levels and was maintained. And we see here in contrast that a patient who had a normal range uh, for tryptase before desensitization, during desensitization had a pretty severe elevation and that was corrected with a different protocol and the patient was able to continue on desensitization and uh, the uh, tryptase level was normal. So what's the unmet need here for uh, biomarkers? So the unmet need is that we don't have a quick turnaround for tryptase and is uh, not systematically used. So uh, the recommendation is that an elevation of tryptase has a very po uh, predictive, uh, very good positive predictive value. Finding a negative tryptase, again, uh, will not be helpful. So the negative pre predictive value is not as good as uh, at the um, positive predictive value. So um, what is the new uh, marker uh, for um, the uh, uh, reactions to monoclonals? We see here that in reactions to rituximab, we can have elevations of tryptase. And we see here that this can also happen and can uh, happen here. But we see also that IL-6 is a new biomarker that we can actually evaluate in reactions to monoclonals. And we see here that for a reaction uh, to rituximab, it can be 10 times more elevated than baseline. But we also see here that for brentoximab, for obinotuzumab, uh, for tozolizumab, for all those monoclonal antibodies, we can also observe during reactions that are cytokine storm uh, related or that are mixed reactions, the normal uh, baseline range can be uh, increased by 10 or by 1,000. So again, a very useful biomarker uh, that will lead us to further understand the uh, phenotype and the endotype of reactions to monoclonal antibodies. So we have here that uh, the monoclonal antibodies that we are, have available uh, could be like with a general suffix of OMAB where they would contain mostly the, the murin uh, epitopes, but uh, ZMAB that would contain a chimeric with uh, a lot of human, but still uh, a lot of mouse, and then humanized and fully human uh, antibodies. So the point is, are uh, fully human antibodies, like they are 99.99% human, are going to give reactions or no. And we see here that the potential for immunogenicity decreases as the monoclonal antibodies are actually humanized. But still, uh, one important point to be made is, as I showed you at the beginning, the sugars are going to be different than the normal sugars placed by uh, uh, the human body so that the antigenicity of the uh, monoclonal antibodies will come from the fact that the sugar moieties are not uh, totally uh, human or human-like. So antibodies that have um, been humanized can still induce hypersensitivity reactions. And as we can see here, the reactions that we can uh, get from those monoclonal antibodies can be infusion reactions. And those infusion reactions, which sometimes are, uh, have been associated with some cytokine relief, are mild, uh, can be associated with mild chills, mild fever, uh, and uh, the symptoms can actually be treated uh, with fluids, with antihistamines, with sometimes steroids. And most of the time, we don't need to do desensitization for those infusion reactions. For reactions that are more severe, and again, type 1 IgE, and sometimes non-IgE mediated, where we are able to obtain a tryptase level or where we are able to do skin testing and uh, or basophil activation tests and further understand the mechanism of those reactions, definitely desensitizations are indicated for those reactions. The same occurs for cytokine release syndromes or for mixed reactions where we have a combination of potentially uh, cytokines such as IL-6 and tryptase. And in those cases, uh, desensitization is going to be 
uh, possible and is going to be indicated. And even in type 4 reactions now, uh, we have seen type 4 reactions with their subcutaneous infusions uh, of uh, monoclonal antibodies uh, and with local reactions and with more systemic type 4 reactions, we have been able to uh, indicate desensitization for those reactions. So that we have here what we were talking about, that when we evaluate uh, those reactions, uh, we can see if there is an immediate reaction or a type 4 reaction. We have the, uh, the um, uh, biomarkers available, uh, whether tryptase, whether basophil activation tests. We can also have specific IGs, which uh, we, should, we are working on. And then we have a skin testing, and uh, those uh, then will be classified into either uh, a mild, moderate, or severe reactions. And desensitization will definitely be indicated for all the severe reactions and for moderate reactions with positive skin testing. And with the mild reactions with negative skin testing, we have the ability to uh, do a standard infusion with uh, premedications. Again, in terms of the what we call the scores, the desquamation, the skin blistering, the serum sickness, the dress, and even serum sickness, uh, we are not uh, indicating uh, the uh, desensitization. And there are instances in which we have been asked uh, to provide uh, recommendations for serum sickness or for some others. And that will be, again, personalized medicine in a base case uh, to case basis and uh, uh, telling us what is the need for the patient and uh, what is the risk for the patient uh, to potentially die of uh, desensitization uh, for um, if it did use a Steven Johnson or toxic epidermal necrolysis. So uh, candidates for desensitization uh, have been uh, typically patients who have Ig mediated reactions and you see here that the agents uh, have been uh, what you already know, other chemotherapies, antibiotics, iron, uh, monoclonals, uh, taxins also, and non-IgE, which again, some monoclonals will be uh, having positive or negative skin testing, and uh, cytokine storm reactions, mixed reactions. And then for type 4, we have that um, the uh, we can also do uh, desensitizations. So, um, what stratification we do for those uh, is uh, uh, using the Brown classification for a grade one, grade two, and grade three, in which uh, severe reactions are reactions in which we see uh, desaturation, hypotension, convulsion, syncope. Uh, with moderate reactions, we see two organ systems that are affected, and with the mild reactions, we see one organ system. And the indications uh, uh, for uh, intravenous usage will be um, that 3 back 12 step, a classical protocol, uh, is used for moderate and mild reactions, and high risk uh, or more severe reactions uh, can be used a 4 back protocol. If uh, we go to the indications of desensitization, we have that it continues to be a high-risk procedure and needs to have a patient who is critically ill where there is no alternative medication for this patient. And it's a temporary phenomenon, although I'll show you some data about inducing potentially a more long-term uh, um, vaccination effect. Uh, it's antigen specific, so desensitizing to one agent does not uh, create any tolerable tolerance to other uh, agents. And uh, increasing suboptimal doses uh, and concentrations is what we use. And uh, again, if we can maintain that desensitization, such as in patients desensitized to aspirin and maintain on aspirin, or patients desensitized to antibiotics and maintain for 10 days in antibiotics, that is a uh, something that can be achieved. Um, the uh, types of desensitizations, as mentioned before, that are indicated are the type 1 desensitizations with uh, IgE, mast cells, basophils implicated, and the biomarkers that we have are here. The uh, major biomarker is tryptase. Um, we have, as mentioned before, MRGPRX2, which is a new uh, receptor on mast cells, which mediates reactions to quinolones and uh, uh, also uh, general anesthetics uh, and some other 
uh, medications. And we have observed that patients can be desensitized to quinolones also. Uh, and so that receptor is amenable to desensitization. For type 4 reactions, again, we have reactions that are scars that we cannot desensitize, uh, which because uh, either we don't understand the mechanism of those reactions, or if we understand it, is HLA-mediated, such that, that even a small amount of the medication could induce Steven Johnson or toxic epidermal necrolysis. But for maculopapular rashes, for mild to moderate rashes, uh, we actually can uh, desensitize. The principles of desensitization are here so that uh, if we have a target dose and a threshold for activation, we uh, now know that desensitization uh, goes beyond, uh, below the threshold. So uh, here you have a little bit of the basic science that uh, we have generated and others have generated uh, to further understand what happens during desensitization. And I will actually use the example here, a patient uh, allergic to carboplatin and it, uh, uh, monoclonals would be the same, has a positive skin test with a will and flare reaction before desensitization that becomes negative, and this patient was done without uh, premedication to avoid that antihistamine will block the histamine release. So uh, by desensitizing patients, we create a very fundamental uh, inhibition of the mediator's release, and we have here that those are mast cells who have IgE and then IgE bound to IgE receptors, and antigen comes, and uh, by antigen coming, it cross-links the IgE receptor, and there is internalization, and there is release of uh, uh, mediators such as streptase, histamine, and others, and then there is also release of cytokines. During desensitization, what happens is uh, the way we deliver antigen blocks uh, uh, the uh, internalization of the uh, uh, antigen and the IG receptor, which remains at the membrane, and we stabilize the membrane so that further antigen cannot be internalized and there is no calcium influx in the cell. So it is a very profound and fundamental inhibition that occurs at the membrane level. And it's important that we choose the right starting dose, uh, that we choose the time between the doses, the increments are critical, and that we understand it's specific and also can be maintained. So this is the universal protocol that we apply and others have uh, used other protocols. Uh, this is the uh, four bag uh, and then this is the three bag, either one in a thousand, the initial concentration, one in a hundred, one in 10 and the full concentration. And essentially we go uh, uh, doubling the doses uh, at every 15 minutes, 10, 20, 40, and 80. And we end up uh, injecting the full amount of the medication at the end of the desensitization. And the symptoms that we have uh, seen that are amenable to rapid desensitization, as I've been uh, shown to you, are in cutaneous, cardiovascular, respiratory, uh, throat tightness, gastrointestinal, there is a symptom that we didn't know that is pain. So patients who present with pain associated with other symptoms of hypersensitivity are truly amenable to desensitization. And this is new. And you see here that rituximab, for example, induces severe pain, but other monoclonals and other agents also induce a, a severe pain. I will also... Um, show you here uh, that, for example, pembrolizumab uh, in uh, another clinical vignette for small, uh, lung, uh, small cell lung cancer, uh, in the 10th infusion develop uh, sneezing, congestion, uh, throat tightening, changes in voice, and periorbital swelling that require epinephrine. And uh, the uh, patient, one of the errors that uh, is commonly done is to increase premedication in patients who uh, have presented an aphylaxis. And so in this patient, uh, it was uh, tempted to do that um, with more antihistamines, and with more prednisone, with more steroids, with more uh, COX-1 inhibitors, and uh, she presented even more severe uh, symptoms. So again, uh, there are some hard uh, ships here because the patient was not able to do a skin testing and preptase was not obtained at the uh, um, times of those uh, two reactions. 
but the phenotype of the reaction, uh, uh, what we thought would be a type 1 reaction and potentially IG mediated, was very clear to us. And so a 3 back 12 step was generated. And uh, the, you have here the protocol that was able to deliver the medication and apply to 10 exposures. And the patient has been receiving uh, pembrolizumab through this desensitization protocol. Uh, we also have work with PARP inhibitors, uh, and this was published in the New England a couple of years ago. A 49-year-old uh, woman who had platinum-sensitive relapse of a high-grade uh, peritoneal cancer uh, uh, who was a stage four and had a BRCA mutation, which again is a mutation that predisposes patients to uh, have more uh, uh, reactions. Uh, she uh, completed her treatment and was placed on uh, uh, oloparinib. And uh, uh, she presented after uh, taking the 400 milligram dose urticaria uh, and uh, angioedema, which was severe. And so she was treated with antihistamines again and uh, could not um, uh, tolerate it. But uh, they tried also uh, omalizumab, which is anti-IG, and we have actually uh, used this agent in some other uh, uh, studies uh, for helping uh, desensitization. And uh, they did use only omalizumab, and, and so uh, they were not able to be successful. Uh, the patient had recurrent symptoms. And so again, our question uh, was, what is the diagnosis and the phenotype of the reaction? Uh, what can be done? And is there anything that we could do to reintroduce uh, the uh, drug safely, since it has already uh, been demonstrated that using more premedications and using something such as omalizumab had not been uh, helpful? So. So again, we see here uh, that, um, oops, sorry, that uh, a desensitization protocol can actually uh, be generated. And you see here that a protocol was generated that included increasing uh, by doubling uh, doses from 12.5 to 25 to 50 to 100 to 200. And, and so during the first day, uh, the uh, dose was achieved uh, to um, the highest dose. And then in the second day, an abbreviated protocol and the patient then was continued on uh, 800 milligrams. So again, uh, the desensitization did work uh, for an oral agent. Um, and uh, we see that how patients can be uh, uh, reactive to something they have not been exposed is by the similarity to natural things. So for example, this uh, PARP uh, inhibitors are similar to nicotinamide and uh, that they can be exposed to those agents or similar agents uh, uh, through uh, foods or, or through uh, other uh, daily uh, living supplements or other um, agents. So um, I wanted to um, uh, summarize here uh, the knowledge that we have uh, in monoclonal antibodies and, and desensitization. We uh, published uh, uh, but a, a couple of years ago our experience in 104 patients with 500 2060 sensation with 16 monoclonal antibodies. Uh, and we observed that the initial reactions are typically the green is uh, the uh, grade of the reaction. So grade one and then grade two, it will be in yellow and grade three would be in red. So you see here that the majority of the patients who are candidates for desensitization had a grade uh, uh, two to three. Uh, and what happened during desensitization is that we see mostly a blue, meaning that patients did not have any reactions or had very mild reactions. So again, the safety of uh, desensitization is paramount. To the extent that the location of our desensitization now has uh, uh, shown to be more uh, into the uh, outpatient arena. So in the past, we had performed high risk desensitizations in the intensive care unit, and we have now pushed all our desensitizations to the outpatient arena and have no do not done any desensitization, even for uh, grade three reactions in the uh, intensive care unit. Most importantly, 
the severity in subsequent desensitization has been decreasing. And you see here that uh, depending on the number of desensitizations, uh, patients who have one to five, there is a, a high decrease in the number of uh, severe reactions, which are zero. But also, if we go and further desensitize the patients, the number of reactions uh, that they pr produce is less and less. So one of the questions that we have is, by doing uh, desensitization, it is possible that, that we induce changes that are similar to the changes that are seen with vaccination or with immunotherapy. And we are studying the potential that uh, IL-10 is induced, uh, uh, IgG4 against uh, those drugs uh, and uh, T regulatory cells. And we have here that uh, the safety of these sensations we have published uh, earlier and it continues to be the same. All the blue is uh, that uh, over uh, 70 to 80% of these sensitizations do not induce any reactions. And when they induce reactions is mostly the green, which is like mild reactions. And very few uh, desensitization induce what we have as yellow and red, uh, uh, less than 10%, six or 7% of uh, reactions uh, that uh, necessitate uh, treatment. Uh, and you have here that rituximab has about 9% of reactions during desensation, but the majority are without reactions or with the green, uh, which is very mild. And um, we see here that the most important thing uh, is based on either the the cost and the life expectancy. And I want to emphasize that the cost of desensitization when uh, uh, using an infusion room uh, for chemotherapy and when using the same trained nurses that use chemotherapy uh, uh, for, and monoclonal antibodies, the cost at the end of the day are not increased. And we see here that we compare patients who are desensitized and not desensitized. Because of the infusions uh, during desensitization are longer, we can also add other uh, treatment options like like IV fluids, add magnesium, uh, and uh, uh, even uh, transfusions can be added to the day of the desensitization, such that we compact the care of those patients. And most importantly, we have actually a look at the life expectancy of desensitized patients versus patients who have not had allergies uh, to their chemotherapy. And this is based on carboplatin, not on a monoclonal. But it reflects that the patients who uh, don't have allergies here and the red ones have exactly the same life expectancy and or improve outcomes. Uh, we are just looking at that. As uh, I was telling you, the uh, fact that those patients have a TH2 phenotype, the fact that we induce uh, potentially T regulatory cells is uh, looking at that, that increases the life expectancy and quality of life of desensitized patients. So it, personalizing desensitization requires that we have a good understanding of what we are treating. Uh, again, phenotypes, endotypes, and biomarkers are available for us to further characterize those uh, reactions. And there are typically drug-specific reactions to infliximab are not uh, are very different than reaction to rituximab uh, and very different to reactions to other uh, monoclonal. We have to do a risk stratification, again, based on what our phenotype is. Skin testing is one of the things that we are pushing uh, forward uh, to have available, uh, reagents available. And then choosing the right protocol for the right patient. The premedication are based typically on the initial reaction. And again, uh, could we use in the future anti-IG, anti-IL-6? As I show you, uh, only using anti-IG um, may not help desensitization, may not help treatment, but may help desensitization. And we have uh, a manuscript in preparation in which we have used anti-IG, omalizumab, uh, for patients who have presented very severe initial reactions who have been able to do desensitization uh, safely with anti-IG. So it's definitely something that we will be uh, using in the future. And anti-IL-6 for those mixed reactions or cytokine strong reactions uh, will also become potentially available. So to finish up, um, I would say that all immune modulators, checkpoint inhibitors, monoclonal antibodies can induce Ig, non-Ig mediated reactions, delayed reactions, local reactions, uh, cytokine storm reactions, and um, those may be amenable to uh, retreatment. Uh, the skin testing uh, is actually something that we have to advocate for and would be very helpful uh, when we deal with Ig uh, mediated reactions. 
and desensitization are available and uh, I didn't show you but we also use it also for local reactions but we are not doing desensitization for scars and again research is ongoing to further understand the mechanism of uh, the desensitization so that we could actually make them better shorter and fast, faster and easier for uh, everybody and we have a desensitization center uh, in Boston a drug hypersensitivity and desensitization center in which uh, we have been teaching desensitization for the last uh, 15 to 20 years and uh, I have been blessed with uh, having not only faculty and uh, fellows, but also uh, nursing. So we have a program to teach nurses uh, who do desensations. And we also have pharmacy, uh, which is a, a critical and essential to uh, our um, desensation program. So I will stop here and uh, entertain any uh, questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Casal. Um, uh, we will now have the questions by uh, Professor Tong. Thank you, very, thank you very much, uh, Professor Castells, for the very interesting talk. Maybe just two important questions. So, in in this day and age, we find that a lot of uh, manufacturers are moving towards creating pre-filled syringes and auto injectors for a lot of monoclonal antibodies. So how do you modify your testing and desensitization regime? I, I find it a big challenge. Yes, no, it's a very interesting question. And like you said, we are geared toward patient preference. So instead of coming to an infusion uh, center, patients prefer to have an auto-injectable. And even for omalizumab, there's a, a pre-filled pre syringes, which we yeah. may start to use, you know, tomorrow. Um, so what we have observed is that the patients continue to present reactions, uh, either local reactions or sometimes, you know, systemic urticaria or systemic reactions. And we have now uh, presented uh, a manuscript for desensitizations that are subcutaneous desensitizations. We have published it for a, a tanner sev for TNF alpha blockers, which are already available in that form. But and we continue to um, to experiment with the uh, delivery of those monoclonals uh, that could be yeah. amendable. So. If you ask me what kind of protocol you, you could use in those patients, uh, we try to mimic the 12-step protocol into small injections. And so initially, so we do a small injections of like maybe seven to 10 small injections. And then if the protocol is successful, when we Continue, we compact those injections. So the next time, if we had seven injections, we will be five injections and we will have three injections. So essentially, because the half-life of the monoclons is 28 to 30 days, we are able to maintain a half-life. And when the patient comes back, we don't need to fully desensitize those patients. So we have been successful at decreasing the amount of injections every time we desensitize a patient to an injectable subcutaneously. But again, this is a, this is a work in progress. So I understand right. that uh, we will be uh, seeing more and more of those reactions and we will be able to adjust those protocols further and further. Yeah, so, so I think the other challenge that we have is you're, you're, you're pretty right to say that it's pretty important now to be able to measure cytokines, chemokine levels, tryptase levels. But I think one of the problems is that a lot of these cytokine assays are not exactly uh, regulatory uh, approved commercial assays, isn't it? And most are actually lab-based assays. So how, what would, you, would your advice if you would want to run this like, as part of a clinical service, knowing that you know, these cytokine assays, there are problems with them being regulated as commercial assays? Right. I think that this is a very important question, and that that is one of the reasons we we initially explore many cytokines. We explore TNF alpha, we explore uh, IL one beta, and we finally explore IL six. And what we have found is that IL six is also uh, some a cytokine that's used by rheumatologists to assess the yeah. efficacy. And so yeah. IL six is actually kind of the the dream the dream cytokine. So we are actually able to actually take it as a proxy of other cytokines. And uh, mm. our studies are based on IL-6. So I, I would say that 
for the, 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 at the present time, I would only choose IL-6 as a cytokine potentially that he can give us, you know, an idea about a cytokine storm, even though it might not be the only one that is released yeah. at the time and not, may not be the only one representing the reaction. Uh, we have found IL-6 very much uh, associated with those reactions. So uh, the uh, we are, are actually have a manuscript in preparation also in which we see all those cytokine related reactions or mixed reactions having uh, an elevation of IL-6. So it seems, you know, and again, this is preliminary, it seems that using something like IL-6, just one and just IL-6 would be having a potentially a good positive impact and a good marker for those reactions. Right. So during this this period of the COVID nineteen pandemic, did you find it very difficult to you know bring patients in for these desensitizations because of the number of visits that you need to bring them in for for the multiple injections, and you know patients being generally a little bit fearful of coming into hospital? Yes, for for um, patients who have subcutaneous desensitizations, uh, we have actually taught them how to do that at home. So oh, they could okay. potentially uh, do that. So we have a protocol for seven steps for, uh, mm -hmm. you know, a Tanner step or, or for uh, Zolaire. And then and then we have those prepared syringes and they can do a, like two two injections or, or, or like three injections at most, you know, no more than three injections. Right. And, and yeah. patients have been successfully treated at home if they can actually receive the, the vial at home. For the other patients who actually are treated monthly, uh, we have actually been going to the hospital ourselves and exposing ourselves to COVID-19, and uh, and and we have been doing that. So I understand some patients are very fearful of going to the hospital because of the potential uh, infection uh, rate, uh, but mm -hmm. there is no no good solution for that uh, at this very yeah. moment. I agree with yeah. you. Yeah. Okay. All right. I think we should let you go quite soon. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you uh, very Ruby? much for hosting me. Yeah. Thank you very uh, much for, you very for your much talk. And, uh, Rihanna, um, really, really uh, deeply appreciate the excellent talk and deeply appreciate the excellent questions posed by Professor Tong and uh, your excellent answers. Um, Apache uh, membership would be greatly um, indebted to you for your valuable contribution. Uh, to our membership. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, everybody. Have a great day now. Okay. Bye bye. Yeah, have a good day. Have a nice clinic. Bye. Yes, thank you. <laughs>